Good morning, everybody. How's everyone doing today? Well, I hope. We have our upcoming keynote speaker there figuring out his camera. There he goes. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. So I am Judy Culbertson. For those of you who are just joining us this morning, I'm executive director of the California Foundation for Agriculture in the Classroom. And hi, Michael. Hi. And I am. Uh, and I'm a pear grower and a wine grape grower. And um, we want to kind of welcome those of you who are joining us for the first time this morning to our 33rd annual conference. Um, just a quick little housekeeping message. We um, will spend, have about 10 minutes between each Zoom session. It, you'll notice that each Zoom session has a new identification. So you'll sign off and sign on to your new one um, after each session. Um, at the end of our session, we have some fun door prizes that we give away, so be sure to stay on till the very end. And I think we'll get going. First off this morning, we have uh, the president of the Calif... Oh, but I want to tell you first what we did last night. Uh, here's a picture um, that we stole from um, Facebook, but uh, this is one of the examples of the pasta that was made during our demonstration last night. We had a great time at Mulvaney's and this, oh, who was that? Can you go back to that one? So that was, uh, call me Chef Marchesi. This was her uh, pasta that she made while we were doing our Zoom live from Mulvaney's. And the uh, next one is uh, Browning Neto, who is our last speaker of the day. Looks like he was also uh, watching Patrick and making his pasta all at the same time. So we had a great time last night. Hope some of you had a great dinner. Um, it, if you could have smelled what was going on, oh my gosh, it was terrific. So um, if you missed it, you still have the recipe that was sent out in the registration bag. So now with that piece of information taken care of, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the chairman of our board of directors for the California Foundation for Agriculture in the Classroom, Jamie Johansson, who is uh, a citrus, um, I should, I, I'm not following. He is a citrus and olive grower and runs Lodestar Olive Oil Company. And he's a first generation farmer. So he has a little different perspective than a lot of us old farmers. And um, so Jamie, thanks for hopping on this morning and yeah. um, welcoming our teachers. Yeah, no, uh, welcome everybody. And thank you for adapting with us to uh, kind of uh, uh, the world we live in now. 2020 has been a rough year. However, California agriculture doesn't stop. Um, I think that is the, you know, and the education of our students won't stop, but we'll adapt to uh, new methods and new ways of doing it. Uh, Judy's right, I'm a first generation farmer, and it really began for me in a classroom. Uh, sometimes we think if we're not born into an industry like agriculture, there isn't a place for us, but I think uh, you quickly find out is um, uh, we are a diverse industry, and whether you want to be a scientist, a pilot, you want to drive a tractor, um, uh, you want to be an educator, it's a unique industry that we have a spot for everyone who has an interest. I think we're one of the few industries we can say with that kind of diversity um, uh, that uh, we, we offer people. And we're a changing industry. We're becoming much more um, uh, technologically advanced. Uh, the educational needs of our students and the future agriculturalists and those working in it continues to grow. In fact, the Department of Labor figures there are 50,000 jobs a year that go unfilled in agriculture because we do not have the number of graduate students required to do the job. A tremendous uh, industry that's changing fast. And as we only saw just a few months, it seems like years ago, um, you know, the uncertainty of would there be food on the grocery shelves. And as president of the California Farm Bureau, spent a lot of time on interviews with uh, uh, news uh, uh, news stations down in Los Angeles and San Francisco asking about the food supply chain um, and, and are we secure. But I can rest assured, um, agriculture doesn't go to sleep. Uh, we continue to work uh, to make a difference. And on behalf of the board, thank you. And our board does represent the diversity that is agriculture. Um, educators, uh, grocery store uh, uh, industry people, uh, restaurateurs like the Mulvaney so appreciate uh, their, their hard work and, and their commitment to the food supply chain. Uh, as well as farmers like myself, and even insurance agents managing our risk on the farms because it is a risky business. But again, thank you for um, making a difference in the students' lives. It's a passion for us uh, at Ag in the Classroom um, that we do want to see uh, our young students uh, 
not only be educated about the agriculture around them, and we are in California, we're fortunate, you can't get away from agriculture. And I grew up in Humboldt County, uh, and I grew up in the Redwoods were my, were, were my backyard, you know, and it wasn't until I left and uh, go to college at Colorado State and, and I came back and I was like, wow, these trees really are big. There's a reason why they're the largest living, you know, uh, 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 things on earth, but we take stuff for granted. But when we drive down the road and now with the rise of urban agriculture, there's probably a garden uh, nearby that can pique interest. So thank you for that commitment. We look forward to hearing uh, uh, your feedback and what we can do different. And of course, in 2021, we look forward to being together again uh, in Ventura, wherever uh, we're going to be um, uh, to meet you personally. And for the first time attendees, I hope it's not your last and I hope you're enjoying it. And thank you, Judy and her team who have really, uh, really adapted and uh, created new opportunities for students to learn uh, uh, about California agriculture. So thank you, and I know you're gonna enjoy Michael. Uh, I can already see on this table, well represented the diversity that is California agriculture. So thank you, Michael, uh, for being here too. And Judy, thank you. All right, thanks so much, Jamie, and hope to see you later on today. Um, and with that, making note of our friend, Michael Marks, I am really pleased to introduce to you our our keynote speaker, which he's done a couple different times for us over the last 33 years, um, mm -hmm. Mr. Michael Marks, your produce man. And um, Michael works in the, um, in the public affairs for the California Department of Public Health, as well as he is a TV personality and we can watch him every Saturday or Sunday on television where he uh, educates people about agriculture. So he's, we're all on the same mission together and we always appreciate his fun and enthusiastic presentation. And Michael, without further ado, let's get fresh with our produce man. Hey, I like that. I like hey. that too. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I appreciate being with all of you. There's so many people out there um, in the Zoom world and uh, it's exciting to be able to speak to you. And I appreciate that. Judy, my goodness, 40 years you have been working with Ag in the Classroom. Well, thank you, Michael. Thank you. <laughs> I started when I was 10. I figured that. <laughs> Back when you started, I think. Yes, it was. Uh -huh. yeah, I, started, uh, I started working in produce in 19... 75, my first job in produce, a little mom pa grocery store uh, up in Amador County. And I know we have some Amador County people uh, zooming in from us today. I wave hi to you. I miss Amador County. I can't wait to get up there and go to Mel's and have a burger and fries and a Frosty from Mel's Diner in Jackson. <laughs> so uh, anyway, we're gonna, have, we're gonna have a ton of fun. These next 30 minutes or so, hold on to your seat, ladies and gentlemen, because we are gonna be moving fast today. You ready for this? Let's have some fun. A little bit more about me, uh, Judy, so everybody will know who I am. I started working in produce uh, 40 year, more than 40 years ago, and uh, I was walking around, I was going around on the first day of every season, taking the fruit or vegetable of that season, and I would take it to literally every radio and TV station in Sacramento. And when I started doing that, nobody was talking about fruits and vegetables. Joe Carcioni wasn't even around. Uh, he had died by then, and so uh, there was nobody talking about fruits and vegetables. So one day, I took uh, some kiwi fruit. It was on the first day of winter that particular year. I took some California kiwi fruit into CBS 13, Channel 13, and uh, I, was, I gave uh, a gift box of kiwi fruit to Tom Laughlin, who was the weather guy, the main weather guy at the time. And I was talking about kiwi fruit to him, telling him some fun facts about kiwi fruit. You know, there's male and female kiwi fruit, and you know, there's four female for every male kiwi fruit, and all kinds of fun facts. And over in the corner in Channel 13 was this little guy I'd never seen before. He wheeled around in his chair and he said, Were you on FM 102 today? KSFM 102, Chris Collins in the Morning Zoo. Many of you from the Sacramento area remember Chris Collins in the Morning Zoo. And I said, yeah, I was on this morning. We were talking about California kiwi fruit. He said, that was great. You were funny. You educated people. Do you want to try television? So I tried television. And that was 32 years ago. I tried television. And I'm still on television. CBS 13 News at noon every Monday and Wednesday. So I get to travel around California, get to travel around the state. I get to travel around all over the world. I've been to Chile twice, Mexico several times, 
been to British Columbia, Massachusetts, Florida, looking at all the produce uh, that, that is coming in. I was actually on an aircraft carrier as well because we have 6,500 men and women working aboard an aircraft carrier and uh, they are several thousand miles away from the nearest grocery store. And I wanted to know where do they get their produce out there? So we flew out, we were on the USS Abraham Lincoln. We flew down to San Diego. They put us on an airplane, it's called a carrier on board, a Cobb. And we flew out about an hour and a half out in the Pacific Ocean. And there was sitting the USS Abraham Lincoln. We landed a very abrupt stop and uh, it was quite fun. And uh, so we spent the next two days aboard an aircraft carrier learning where do they get their produce and how well do our men and women in the Navy eat? Well, the US Navy liked what we did so well that they allowed me to do something I've always dreamed of doing and that was being on a submarine. Now, not just a submarine that's in the harbor. I said, I need to be in a submarine that's actually out in the ocean. So they, they diverted the USS Alaska down from Alaska and down into the Puget Sound in Washington. So we flew up to Seattle and went out to sub-base Bangor and we loaded on a boat and we went out and there was the USS Alaska waiting for your produce man. And it was just bobbing there in the ocean. And so we, we, we board, we go down the little ladder and uh, the, the executive officer said, you have exactly two minutes to do whatever filming you need to do on the top side of the submarine because in two minutes, we're gonna be diving. So we rushed back up at the top and there's this guy up at the top. He was in a, in a wetsuit and he was in scuba gear. And as soon as I got up there, he put a rope around me. And I said, what's the rope for? And he said, that's in case you fall in. So that was good. So we, so we did a, a tease and we did a promo and we did the first part of the first segment up on, on top of the submarine with the Coning Tower behind us. It was a beautiful, beautiful sight. We get down uh, in time for him to say, dive, dive. And so we had lunch 300 feet below the ocean floor. And uh, so we had a ton of fun. So those are some of the fun things I get to do. So Judy, I thought it was really fun. We're gonna, I'm gonna talk really fast. I'm gonna do some motivational things for you. I'm gonna teach you some practical things for you. And I'm, uh, we're, but we're gonna start out with, you've been at Agilent Classroom 40 years. So I went around and I gathered some produce that was not here 40 years ago when Judy first started with Agilent Classroom. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, yeah, I thought, I thought that'd be fun. Thought you'd like yeah. to go through a, a That's lesson fun. with this. So, you know, just looking at the apple section, there are so many varieties of apples. Apples, when you first started, was Red Delicious, Golden Delicious, and a Granny Smith. Maybe a Macintosh every now and then, right? And then we started getting all these new varieties, the Fuji, the Gala, the Braeburn, the Opal Apple, the Honey Crisp Apple. How many of you love a Honey Crisp Apple? That has become one of everybody's favorite. And you know, the, the Red Delicious took 25 years to become popular. And then for the next century, it was, po it was the most popular apple in the world. For a hundred years, it was popular. But the Honeycrisp apple overnight became one of the highest rated apples in the United States ever. Uh, it's a varietal name is actually called MN1711. MN1711. That's what the varietal name is. It came from the University of Minnesota. That's what the MN is for. Now, who would have thought Minnesota? They breed apples in Minnesota. Of course, they breed apples in Washington State. Of course, they breed apples at the University of Cornell in New York. Those are two big apple growing regions. Minnesota, you know why they put an apple growing region, uh, an apple research station in Minnesota? Yeah, back in the 1800s, Horace Greeley, who was a writer for the New York Times, and he's the guy who said, go west, young man, go west. He's the guy who wrote that. Uh, he said, I will never, ever go to Minnesota because they don't grow apples there. So a few apple growers went up to Minnesota and they started growing apples in Minnesota. And so that's why we have the University of Minnesota breeding apples. And they have indeed bred one of the most popular apples. This Honeycrisp apple, I, I got to tell you, is so super and uh, this was not here 40 years ago. I don't know what you did with apples, you know, 40 years ago. It's just awful. But the Honeycrisp apple, you know, by the way, I want to uh, tell you why 
uh, the Honeycrisp is so crunchy. That's what people love about it. It just crunches so good. Uh, if you know those, uh, those plastic bubble wraps that you wrap things in? Well, imagine a bubble wrap that have big bubbles, right? Big cells in the bubble wrap. And when you, and when you pop them, uh, just a little bit of pop. But now imagine a, 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 a wrap, a bubble wrap with tiny little cells in it. When you squeeze it, pop, 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 right? It's a, just a crunch. Well, that's why the Honeycrisp apple is so crunchy. It has some of the smallest cell structures of any apple. And so when you bite into it, crunch, crunch, crunch. And that's why, so just think of, uh, uh, think of that bubble wrap. That's, you can, in fact, you can do an experiment with your kids uh, in the classroom, right? Uh, you can bring in some Honeycrisp apples and do, a, and do a taste test with the Honeycrisp apples when they finally get back in school with you, right? And, uh, and bring in some bubble wrap and teach them, you know, when you squeeze the bubble wrap of a large bubble wrap, just a little bit of a pop. But when you squeeze it with the small one, man, <laughs> pop all over the place. So Honeycrisp apples weren't here. My goodness, uh, that was awful. You just had a couple apples to choose from. Uh, let's see, what else was in? Cuties were not here. There was no such thing as a cutie 40 years ago. Yeah, we had tangerines. It was called a Fairchild tangerine, which I have no clue why anybody grew a Fairchild tangerine because the thing had like 20 seeds in it. I mean, it was just awful. Why would you have a tangerine with seeds with 20 seeds in it? It was terrible. So the Fairchild tangerine was around, but not the cutie. The cutie was not here. Uh, the sumo citrus was not here 40 years ago. In fact, just five years ago, the sumo citrus wasn't here. Sumo citrus was created in Japan because in Japan, they love, uh, they love their tangerines. They, they, they love their satsuma mandarin. And you know how the satsuma mandarin just peels so easily and then it segments so easily and it's just so sweet? Well, they like that, but they also like the size of an orange. So they want, so they literally cross a Satsuma Mandarin with navel oranges to come up with now what we have a Sumo Citrus. It has all the great qualities of a Satsuma Mandarin, but all the size of a, of a navel orange. And I know we have some people here, by the way, from Riverside. And uh, a lot of people don't know this, and probably they know this because they live in Riverside and they work in Riverside. But in the 1910s and the 1920s, Riverside, California, little old Riverside, California, had the highest per capita income of any city in the United States, even New York and Philadelphia and any of the major cities. They had the highest per capita income of any city in the United States, all because of the navel orange, because it began there in Riverside, California, the navel orange, beautiful navel orange. I, I, I would like to do a book one day and eventually make it into a movie, but at the early 1900s, turn of the century, 1800s, 1900s, the USDA literally had what's called fruit and vegetable explorers. They were the Indiana Jones of produce and they literally traveled around the world finding all kinds of different produce items and then sending them back to the United States. That's exactly where we got the navel orange, it was found in Brazil. And so they sent back several trees. A couple of them ended up in Washington, DC, and a couple of them ended up in Riverside, California with Eliza Tibbetts. And Eliza Tibbetts, in fact, you can still see one of those original navel orange trees there in her backyard. Well, it's not backyard anymore. It's there in the corner of Riverside, California. And you can still see it. They have it all protected, but it's very cool. She would take her water from the kitchen and she would go out and water her navel orange and it produced some of the best, sweetest, juiciest, and seedless fruit ever. And that's why the navel orange became so popular in California. And once we built that railroad that connected in Utah, now our navel oranges could go all over the United States, all over the world. And that's when California became a huge powerhouse in agriculture because of railroad transportation. And that navel orange had so much to do with it. Uh, by the way, really quick back, how did the orange get its name? Think about it. How did the orange get its name? I know most of you are thinking because it's 
orange, right? No, it didn't get its name orange because of the color. Actually, the color orange got its name from the orange. That means this fruit was named for something different. If, if uh, you peel an orange in your classroom, eventually everybody can smell it, right? You peel an orange in the kitchen of your house, everybody in the house is gonna come running into the kitchen because they can smell that orange. The orange is the most fragrant, one of the most fragrant fruits on earth. And that's where we get its name orange. It comes from a very, very old Sanskrit word, naranjan, and that word literally means fragrance. It's the most fragrant fruit. In fact, women, you go to Nordstrom, you go to Macy's, and you buy perfume, there's a whole citrus line of perfume. Right, it all started with the navel orange. Uh, in, in the uh, uh, in, in the blurb about the produce man, what I'm going to talk about one of the things it said is I'm going to teach you what onion was created for onion rings, specifically for onion rings. Right, you need to have the perfect onion for onion rings. So I Dr. Leonard Pike at Texas A&M in Texas, in Bryan's and College Station, Texas, he's the one who created the Texas 1015Y onion, and, it is the, and he created it because he loves onion rings, and he wanted to create the perfect onion for onion rings. So I asked Dr. Leonard Pike, unfortunately he died this January, he just uh, died recently, very, very sad. Uh, but I asked him one day, how come you gave that onion such a sexy name? The Texas 1015Y, what a sexy marketing name you gave that onion, right? You could have called it so many other great marketing names, like Texas 1015 Y. Uh, and he said, well, I like to make things easy for the farmer. The Y means it's a yellow onion. That's easy. He also has a 1015 R. So you, you all can tell me what color onion that is? Yeah, that's a red onion, right? Yeah. So what does the 1015 stand for? Uh, 1015 stands for the date you plant it, October 15th. So he said, I want to make things easy for the farmer. It's a 1015Y. He also has, by the way, a 1021Y, which what date do you plant that? Yeah, on my birthday, October 21st, on my birthday, of course, that's when you plant it. Now, Michael, Michael, let me interrupt you and let you know that our next session is a field trip to Gill's Onions. You are in for a treat. Oh my yeah. goodness, get, get your goggles on when you go in there. You're gonna have <laughs> to have your goggles on for that, man. Because man, yeah. you ever cut an onion? You cut yes. an onion, you're gonna cry, so you better get your goggles on. <laughs> oh, yeah, they had quite a trip. You are in for a treat at Onions. They, are, they were revolutionary in the onion industry. And so I'm thrilled for you guys that you guys get to have a virtual tour of yeah. Gills onions without all the tears. So yeah. that's really good for the virtual yeah. tour. Yeah. Uh, let's see, what else wasn't here? You know what else wasn't here? Uh, fresh cut salads. Judy, what did you do 40 years ago when there were no fresh cut fr uh, fruits and vegetables? Remember, I was only 10. Off, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. So fresh cut fruits and vegetables didn't even begin to, until 1989. The very first fresh cut lettuce came out. And then we started uh, thinking, well, let's cut some fruit. So there was an apple grower here in California, David Ratchkovich in Stockton, California. And David, every time he would go home, his, he grew apples, right? And his daughter was eating these whole field mini carrots. And he said, why can't she eat my apples for a snack? Why, why does she have to eat the whole field mini carrots? Well, because they're so easy to eat. And so he created the revolutionary way of cutting apples where they do not, uh, where they do not discolor. And uh, it's amazing what he has done. He's right there in Stockton, California. If you drive down Highway 99, you see the big plant there right near the airport. And uh, my goodness, and that's why he created the fresh cut apples. So his daughter would now eat apples. It's amazing. There's another fruit that was created for a granddaughter. Uh, and this fruit is called the pluot. You've all heard of the pluot. What a cool fruit this is. Oh my goodness, the pluot. Now, uh, uh, it was Floyd Zeiger in Modesto, California. He would come in and his granddaughter, he grew plums in Modesto, California, and his granddaughter would not eat his plums. She would eat all kinds of other fruits, all kinds of other vegetables, but wouldn't eat his plums. 
Well, that ticked him off. He said, well, I'm going to create a plum that my granddaughter will fall in love with. So he created the pluot. The pluot is uh, it's two thirds plum, one third apricot. If you cross an apricot with a plum, you get a plum cot. It's 50-50. Now, if you take that plum cot, cross it one more time with another plum, you get a pluot. That's what two thirds plum, one third apricot. And now you know why all the pluots have crazy kid names because Floyd Zeiger wanted to make sure that kids loved his pluots. So that's why the name Dapple Dandy, Dinosaur Egg, Dynamite, all these cool names of the pluots that he gave, right? And it's all because he was trying to get his granddaughter to fall in love with his plums that he ate. Uh, there were no uh, cotton candy grapes back in 1980. How many of you have fallen in love with a cotton candy grape? Oh my goodness, unbelievable. You know where the cotton candy grape originated? University of Arkansas. <laughs> You'd never dream, Arkansas, right? That's where it all began. Uh, there were three farmers here in California. Uh, there were three farmers, John Pandle, uh, Jim Beagle, uh, you know John Pandle, uh, Jim Beagle, and uh, Professor David Kane, Dr. David Kane. And they were at the University of, of Arkansas and they found this one line of grapes that seemed really interesting to them. Now, the grandparent to these grapes was the Concord grape. Do you know why Concord grapes are the only grape we make uh, uh, grape jelly out of? The Concord grape? Because it's the only grape we can smell. You can't smell any other grape. You can't smell a Thompson seedless. There's no aroma to a red flame seedless grape, but this but it, since this came from a Concord, it had aroma. So they said, what if we took this grape back to California and we crossed it with some of the great California grapes, like the Thompson seedless grapes, so we get the size, we get big berry size, right? So they started doing that and he came up with the cotton candy. They named it cotton candy. If you've never tried it, I'm sorry you haven't tried it. It tastes exactly like cotton candy. It is unbelievable. Now I just have a few more minutes and I, I wanted to make sure I ended with some motivational. You can teach so much to your kids uh, about produce. And I want you to be able to encourage your kids uh, in school, whether you're uh, distance learning or, or in a classroom. Uh, maybe you have a student that hasn't been doing very well on tests and they, they failed maybe a couple tests. I want you to be able to encourage that student. And I want you to go grab a red delicious apple. A red delicious apple originated in Peru, Iowa. And Jesse Hyatt was the farmer. Now, Jesse Hyatt uh, was a, a Quaker, so he had a very neat and orderly orchard. And, but one spring, he walked out into his orchard, and in between two rows of trees, right in the middle, there was this little apple seedling growing up. Little apple seed. Well, he can't have that. It, it would mess up his whole orchard. So he took his, out of his little pocket knife, and he cut that thing down. He cut that apple tree down. Well, the next spring, he was walking through his orchard to see what the ice and the snow did to his trees and what trees fell over. And he was walking through, and he noticed right in that same spot, that same, that little apple tree grew back bigger. He got out his pocket knife, and it took him a little longer, but he cut down that little apple tree. Now, the third spring, he walked out, to his, uh, he walked out into his orchard, and he immediately went to that spot in his orchard where that uh, apple tree had grown up, and guess what was there? That apple tree grew back bigger and stronger. In fact, he couldn't cut it with his knife. He had to go back to the barn and get a hatchet. And he came back and he cut that tree down a third time. The fourth year, he went back out to that same area in the orchard and there was that tree. It was growing back bigger, taller, stronger. And he said, being a Quaker, he was very merciful too. He said to that little tree, if thou must live, then thou mayest live. And he let that tree grow. Eight years later, he began picking one of the most unusual apples he had ever seen. It was long, it was elongated, a beautiful red color. He cut into it with his pocket knife and just juice went everywhere. And so he named this apple, the Hawkeye apple, after his state of Iowa, right? 20 years later, uh, the Stark Brothers Nursery got a hold of it and said, no, we're gonna call this Red Delicious. So you can motivate your kids. It does not matter how many times you fail. It does not matter how many times you may lose. 
it matters that you just keep getting up. And it, when you get up, you get back stronger and better each and every time. Motivate your kids with that. I'll end with this, Judy, because I know I'm probably going over time here, and I'm sorry. I could talk forever about fruits and vegetables. You, you know that. But I wanted to end with, uh, with bananas. I end all, most of my talks with bananas. And uh, bananas are a very unusual fruit. First of all, they grow upside down, which is quite unusual. Uh, it's a climactric fruit. You know what climactric means, right? Mm -hmm. Climactric means it, it cannot ripen on the plant. It has to be picked, and then it begins ripening. That's the same thing with an avocado. You'll never have a tree ripened avocado because you have to pick the avocado in order for it to begin the ripening process. So the banana, a climactric fruit, grows upside down. You harvest it, it begins to ripen. So uh, what does this have to do with your kids? You know, it's very interesting. Bananas are the only fruit in the entire world that bruises from the inside out. There's no other fruit in the world that bruises from the inside out. I could drop this apple and I'm gonna see a bruise right there on it. But if I were to drop these bananas onto a hard surface, an hour from now, I could cut that banana in half and right in the very heart, right in the very center of the banana, you can see this little discoloration begin. Bananas are the only fruit in the entire world that bruises from the inside out. I call it, uh, the psychology of bananas because people are the same way. We bruise from the inside out. Kids bruise from the inside out. Sometimes a kid, uh, a child has been bruised and you don't even see the bruise. You can't see it because it's from the inside. Maybe years later, you can see it later. So I encourage all, all kids when I speak to them, please speak kind words to each other especially to your family, especially to your brother or your sister. Speak kind words. You don't want to go around bruising people. Uh, and you could just grab a banana and teach your kids. By the way, uh, everybody hold up a banana. Everybody hold up a banana right now. Everybody. Thank you. Now I want you to imagine you're peeling that banana. There. I just taught you a new word. That's the sign language word for banana. There you go. Back to you guys. Perfect. That's great, Michael. Oh my gosh. I could just sit and listen to you and from all the comments coming in, everybody's just in awe and they haven't had time to think of a question because you're on to the next great fact that you shared with us. So um, thank you so, so very much. Um, such good stuff. I, yeah, one person even said their nine-year-old is sitting with them thoroughly enjoying your presentation. So I'm sure this information will be passed along to students throughout the state. And we just thank you a bunch for doing this. We'll have you again and um, have a great day. Thank you, Judy, for thinking yep. of me. All of you uh, take produce into your classrooms, please. You, you betcha. Thanks. Thanks so much.